It was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear it and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny St., and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. Today we'll be speaking with Yuval Ben David of Eco Peace Middle East. Eco Peace Middle East is a unique organization that brings together Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli environmentalists. Their primary objective is the promotion of cooperative efforts to protect their shared environmental heritage. In so doing, they seek to advance both sustainable regional development and the creation of necessary conditions for lasting peace in their region. Yuval Ben David is the Investment and Entrepreneurship Officer in the Tel Aviv office of EcoPeace, working to harness the private sector towards a green and sustainable peace in the region. Originally from Northern Israel, he grew up in Pittsburgh, studied history at Yale and Middle Eastern studies at Oxford. Before EcoPeace, he has worked on projects for the World Bank, the UN, and a cybersecurity startup. I'm excited to be speaking with you today, Yuval. Welcome. Thank you, Penny. Nice to be here. Yuval, how would you describe EcoPeace Middle East? Uh, so EcoPeace, I mean, you described it very well. Um, I mean, the how I usually start off describing eco peace is actually um, in how we're organized. I, mean, I think we mm -hmm. were probably, I don't know if the only organization in the world, but, but certainly unique in that we're, uh, we're not an Israeli organization or a Palestinian organization or a Jordanian organization. We're an Israeli Palestinian Jordanian organization. Uh, with three co-directors with I feel like saying amen after that you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah. great um yeah so it's um I mean it's uh certainly uh I mean I think we 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 practice what we preach first of all um and we we exemplify uh cooperation you know it's in our DNA as an organization mm -hmm. um from from day one um, and, and basically what it means is that for, I mean, I, I think the governance is, is very interesting, right? We have those three directors for every, uh, position, you know, we have people doing, you know, working on the same things in in the different offices. So I work on investments out of Tel Aviv, but I have colleagues in, uh, in Amman and in Ramallah who, who work on this with me. Um, 
so I sort of report both to a regional manager and a, uh, and a manager in Tel Aviv. Um, and that makes life very interesting. And it, you know, it, it means that um, day to day we're, you know, we're, we're WhatsApping and, and collaborating and, um, and working with people uh, on the other side uh, as well. It doesn't even feel, I mean, uh, maybe it's, it's funny. You know, I think sometimes when I tell people about my work, uh sounds like really shocking you know that you go to work you go to work every single day with you know with uh with people working in an office in ramallah and amman but just the most natural thing in the world um so that's i mean so that's i think the the really interesting thing about about eco peace um you know it means that we um we work to i mean so we're an environmental organization as you mentioned mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. the the history i think is really interesting um it was founded back in the heyday of uh of the middle east peace process as it was known back in the 90s uh the new middle east if you remember shimon perez uh talking about the the new middle east um and there was uh there was all this uh this sort of talk of uh the economic development that would come on the heels of uh, of all the peace agreements and uh, and Israel normalizing its relations with uh, with its neighbors, um, and so it was actually founded back in '94 as an envi- regional environmental organization to to advocate for the environment. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in in the wake of of all this, you know, sort of untrammeled, unimpeded economic development. You know, for example, hotel rooms, you know, on the Dead Sea, um, things that would have really negative environment shared environmental impacts um and so um that was the original sort of purpose intent and then very quickly you know the region being what it is uh we were back to another round of violence and um uh you know the, the peace process stalled um and sort of our ability to keep on cooperating and working together on these shared environmental concerns uh, sort of created i'd say pioneered this this field that's you know now known as environmental peace building right the, the sort of using the environment as an entry point to to building the conditions for peace right because uh, the environment is is not something that knows or recognizes human or political borders um i think in the middle east something like uh you know at at least every country or every two countries um or or how do how do i phrase this um you know every country has at least one shared aquifer i think Hmm. um in the region like water water aquifer Hmm. um i think about 60 percent of the the water ecosystems in the region cross borders or, or cross boundary. Um, and these are obviously our drying region. Climate change is happening about twice as fast here as it's happening mm. in, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, heating very fast, drying very fast. Uh, a lot of shared concerns about, uh, about uh, water scarcity, drying, extreme heat, uh, extreme weather events. Um, and these are things we really need to to tackle together. Um, so our ability to to do that and to to see that uh, that sort of larger larger objective together um, creates you know the space to to work together to to see you know the the benefits of 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 talking to the other side. Um, it's not a replacement for. You know, for the really hard conversations we need to have about political issues, um, you know, we certainly are not, you know, saying let's just talk about the environment instead of you know talking about these other things. But in order as societies to to be able to have all these other hard conversations we need to have, I think we also need to learn to to trust each other. And working together on the environment is is one is one very important way to do that. So what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve in your, your, between your work on the environment and um, peace, obviously, but 
but the environment is is this catalyst that you have chosen and with a fabulous side benefit of peace as well so uh what are your goals i think that, i mean so why i mentioned water and i mentioned uh you know climate change those are obviously two uh two key themes you know, two key concerns in the region we work a lot in the jordan river valley because it's a shared ecosystem um jordan river valley basin is um is shared by you know, israelis palestinians and jordanians we do a lot of work there um uh, both in terms of um, economic development and sort of green economy so green economic development water solutions um and rehabilitation restoration of of uh the the, the valley um the basin um the i mean the the organization now sort of has a um uh a big uh concept called the green blue deal um that we came out with a few years ago um and this is sort of big let's say uh the sort of driving agenda for a lot of what we've been doing as an organ as an organization um and the the green blue deal um basically talks about i mean it takes um basically looks at at climate change um and you know these different separate commitments that each country that israel jordan uh Palestinian authority that, that we've all made to these international agreements, to these frameworks that, you know, the sort of the, the changing the, the, the sort of the, the efforts we need to make in, in terms of mitigation and, and adaptation to climate change um, and identifies the places where we can really cooperate. Um, you know, so there's basically four pillars to, uh, to the Green Blue Deal. Um, and one is right, sort of cooperation on um, adaptation in terms of water and energy security. Um, so I can I can talk about that in a sec. Sort of what we're what we're doing there. Um, two is you know also thinking about uh, the the politics of of water. So advocating for um, you know for uh, renewed. Um, uh, water allocations between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, there's sort of, there's a, a history here uh, back as part of Oslo, you know, there was a, an allocation of what's known as the, the mountain aquifer. So the, the water resource shared by Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and, and the Oslo agreement, if you remember, was supposed to be a temporary agreement, right? So it was supposed to be just a temporary five-year agreement. Um, and then, you know, by the end of, by the 21st century to have a final status agreement um and here we are you know how many years later over two decades later and still no final status agreement so the a lot has changed on the ground um in terms of you know demographic growth in terms of um israelis and palestinians uh relative um sort of advancements in um uh in uh water reuse um right in desalination um so israel gets you know israel is 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 very very good at reusing um water for agriculture um in desalinating water um the palestinians um have been spending all that time under uh israeli military occupation um and you know and and haven't been able to um to make the same strides in terms of of those technologies necessarily so um there's there's relative inequities um and we need to adapt the agreement um to you know to the current realities because we're, we're still sort of allocating water based on something that was signed back in you know in the mid 90s on the assumption that that it would be just a temporary thing um so we do need to to advance uh, reallocations of, of water on a political level. Um, we need to work, you know, the third pillar of this Green Blue Deal is about uh, sort of impact investment in uh, in the Jordan Valley. Um, so Jordan Valley is um, is an under underdeveloped 
uh, region, you know, relative or subregion relative to, to the wider region. Um, and, you know, we're really trying to drive uh, investment in, um, in climate support initiatives and, and promote sort of job development, job creation um, through things like, you know, food technologies, uh, water technologies. I can, I can talk about some of the work we're doing there because that's specifically what I work on. Um, and then we also do a lot of work as part of this Green Blue Deal on uh, promoting public awareness, right? Specifically with youth, right? So to do all these things, um, you know, you need to get people uh, to believe in them, um, you know, to, to buy into them. Um, so we sort of work both top down and, and bottom up, you know, as we say, and this is really the sort of bottom up um, idea. Uh, so it's about building, you know, future leaders, uh, training future leaders in um, water diplomacy and the skills needed to uh, to talk about uh, uh, natural resource sharing and um, and uh, to really get people uh, excited and 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 to learn to trust um, and to, to sort of give them the tools to do that. So I can. Yeah, talk about yeah, I was kind of wondering, you know, with these different groups and with the youth and do you give them some kind of conflict resolution tools to go over? And so when they interact with one another, I mean, just getting, you know, uh, Israeli, uh, um, you know, Jewish Israeli and Palestinians speaking even though they live right next to each other, you know, the interactions aren't always there, or, or at least positive interactions aren't always there. So I'm curious, do you also tackle that? So the, the learning together, the interactions go more smoothly? Uh, is, is that an issue or are the people who participate already over that? <laughs> I don't think people are over it. And obviously, you know, we, um, you know, I think people come to our programs for different reasons. You know, there's a lot of peace programs out there, mm -hmm. um, you know, and really, I think we, we try to foster skills beyond just sort of, um, you know, we're not just doing sort of get to know, get to know people from the other side program. Right. Um, we really, and I think that that, is more effective in a way because when people create things and you know and learn about something you know something else entirely together mm -hmm. um it's much more effective than just sort of hashing out our you know our our, our problems with each other our, our narratives um that's really mm -hmm. important too but that's not necessarily what we do right so one of the programs mm -hmm. for example that you know that i help run is a it's called the green social entrepreneurship program um and what we do is we teach um sort of entrepreneurship startup 101 skills if you will um and as part of this program it's sort of a pre-incubation program sort of the the industry lingo for it um basically we're we're helping incubate uh new ventures new new startups in sort of the the green economy field um mm you know things around like fertilizers and bio waste and um they basically look at you know at the environmental issues in the region and and try to tackle them through startups and and they do it together right so they create teams of israelis and palestinians and jordanians working together um these are people who's are you know in their 20s 30s um come from all sorts of different backgrounds um and yeah, occasionally, you know, we'll have, um, we'll have tensions, um, because things on the ground are <laughs> dynamic, right? So, you know, we had yes. right now, we've got a lot of, of tensions in, in the region, mm -hmm. um, you know, back in May with the Operation mm -hmm. Gaza. And, and sometimes that, um, sometimes we feel that, you know, with our with our participants um sure but i think for the most part you know and obviously we have to <laughs> we can't ignore it um mm -hmm. but um but really what we do is we create a space to talk about 
things that we care about because we're not defined just by our being Israelis or Palestinians, right? I mean, the people who participate in these programs there, I mean, we've got brilliant, brilliant engineers um, from Palestine in this, uh, in this Green Social Entrepreneurs Program, um, you know, brilliant people from um, across the spectrum of Israeli environmental organizations, um, from, you know, people who've done, I think one of the participants, you know, she, she um, had her own startup and went to Africa and worked on a solar startup there. And, you know, people really come from very varied backgrounds, um, often having nothing to do with, you know, peace or the conflict or and that, but they, um, you know, eco pieces, right. the address to, to, to do interesting environmental work and, um, and, and they understand that, you know, to, to, to do environmental work in the region, uh, mm -hmm. you can't operate just within Palestinian borders or, or Israeli borders, you know, within the confines of, of your political, um, sort of territory. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's what I'd say about that. So what would you, um, consider some of your greatest accomplishments of your program? So there, I mean, there are many, right? Or Ecopiece has been around for, um, so I'm not very good at math, but since 94. So what is that? Um, Long many, time. Many, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I actually, I should know, because I, so about 20, 28 years, something like that. Um, that's how old I am. So I, I should know. Um, and um, I mean, many, many achievements. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the ones that I, that I always like to talk about, um, you know, is a recent one, um, which is part of this Green Blue Deal. You know, I mentioned sort of fostering, um, you know, cooperation on adaptive capacities around water and, um, and energy. And, you know, one of the the, the big headlines that came out of the region only in the past year is this this big agreement signed uh, between the Israeli and Jordanian governments around a water for energy exchange. Um, so basically, Israel is going to give or sell desalinated water to Jordan, which is, I think, the second most water stressed country in the world, um, and in return is going to um, to get solar energy from Jordan um, because Israel has committed, you know, is, is not going to be able to meet its commitments to, um, you know, on renewable energy, its commitments to, to Paris and Glasgow, um, just because it mostly doesn't have the, the land um, to, you know, for all the solar energy that it, it needs to build. Um, and Jordan has a lot of land, um, a lot of sun. And so there's this, you know, we, we basically, this is modeled on the, the coal and steel agreement in Europe back in the, you know, back after World War II between France and, and Germany, what was sort of the, the bedrock of, of today's EU. Um, and the idea of, of sort of promoting um, sustainable and, and healthy interdependencies, right? So, you know, it's a win-win for Israelis and Jordanians. We need their renewable energy, they need our water. Um, you know, you can build, uh, there, there is also an initiative to, to build a desalination plant in the south of Jordan, but piping it all the way up to Amman is, is a lot more expensive than just getting it from, um, you know, from uh, the Mediterranean coast. Um, and so um, this agreement uh, was signed in the UAE back, um, you know, at the end of 2021. Um, John Kerry was there, um, and Ecopeace has, has been pushing for this since, I think, 2017, um, right? So commissioning uh, research and, um, and doing sort of advocacy work with both regional stakeholders and, and getting a sort of coalition from the international community, um, you know, very high-level diplomats from, um, from around the world to, to sort of stand behind this thing. Um, and that's a huge, I mean, it's a huge achievement. It's going to change. Um, I mean, it is already um, really changing uh, Israel's relationship with, with Jordan for the better. Um, you know, we have 
um, the, 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 it's, it's interesting, you know, how water here is, is really rising to the top of the agenda, right? I mean, I, I don't sort of like the, you know, personally, I sort of don't like, you know, attaching security to everything, you know, energy security, food security, water security, we don't need to securitize everything. But this is a region where, um, you know, security matters and water yeah. security um, water security is critical for Jordan um, and energy security is critical for Israel um, and we really need each other um, to succeed here and, and to adapt to um, to both mitigate and, and adapt to to climate change um, so really creating a you know a strong, I think a strong sort of um, uh, foundation for many, many more years of, you know, of, of further cooperation on this thing. This is just the beginning of, um, you know, of this water for energy exchange. I think it can grow to a uh, much wider scale and we're, you know, we're working on that as well. Um, another, agree and, you know, another sort of success of EcoPeace that I, um, that I'll mention just because I think it sort of exemplifies the, the way we work as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so this was about, um, I don't remember the exact year, um, but um, you know, basically the, um, the international community, the World Bank was trying to build a, um, uh, a modern, the first modern wastewater treatment plant in Gaza. Um, and, um, and was really coming up against, um, you know, the sort of the, uh, the, the, um, complexities, um, uh, of, uh, of the region. Um, Israel has blockaded Gaza for, for many years, um, you know, military blockade ever since Hamas rose to power there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and also ever since the sort of this phenomenon of, of terror tunnels um, from, um, from Gaza into, into Israel, um, there's been sort of a, a lot more, a lot more concern about uh, um, sort of what's known as dual use. Right? So things like concrete getting into the wrong right. hands and being used to, to build those tunnels. Right. Um, so the concrete that was needed to build this wastewater treatment plant was being held up um, because um, because the Israeli government was saying, well, you know, one, we've got a blockade, and two, um, you know, it could uh, it could have a dual military dual use, um, and um, and so the international community sort of reached out to EcoPeace, um, said, help us, you know, help us get this done. Um, you know, we one of the as an organization, the fact that we have offices, you know, in Israel and Palestine and Jordan means that we have those relationships on the ground um, and the sort of the credibility with local actors in all three places. And we're, we're, we're able to, to get things moving sometimes um, that others might not be. So, um, you know, what we, the strategy that uh, the EcoPeace formulated for you know for dealing with this was really looking at israeli self-interest right i mean what is the israeli self-interest in building a wastewater treatment plant in gaza um and you know if you look at a map of israel you'll see that only you know very very close to gaza just a bit north of gaza is um you know are both ashkelon and, and ashdod um and yes yeah home to um, to major, you know, Israeli population centers. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thinking was, well, you know, if all this waste, you know, this, this sewage from Gaza is going untreated, um, then, you know, there's probably, probably diseases um, mm -hmm. you know, finding their way to Israeli shores. Um, and so we decided to test the waters on the beach and um, on the beaches there. Um, and... Um, you know, for things like cholera and, and so on, nasty, nasty things. Um, and there was sort of a serendipity, an element of serendipity here, because when we took it to the lab, 
um, you know, the lab, I think the results came back negative. Um, but so, you know, that, okay, good, good idea, you know, thinking about mm -hmm. the, the sort of health concerns. Um, but, uh, but the lab came back and said, um, you know, the sort of, there was an offhand mention that uh, the desalination plant um, was being shut down. And this is, you know, another interesting thing that we, you know, I, I think a sort of wise tactic that we take is when we go to labs, we go to the labs that the, um, you know, that the government also uses, right? Because you don't want to bring scientific evidence to the government, you know, as part of your advocacy and for them to sort of dismiss it because, oh, well, you know, we don't work with or we don't believe that's, right. that scientists. Not. You want to use the, the sort of the labs mm -hmm. and the scientists that the government trusts um, mm -hmm. so they can't, uh, they can't just dismiss you offhand. And um, and we discovered um, in that process that the, you know, the lab is also the lab that works with the desalination plant and that you know, someone there mentioned that the desalination plant was being shut down because of the sewage. Something loud from the screen, I called it. Um, so then we filed the Freedom for Information Act um, and basically have sort of freedom of information request, um, the Israeli equivalent of the, the Freedom of Information Act, um, and um, and discovered that yes, indeed, the desalination plant was shut down constantly uh, because of this untreated sewage from from Gaza, basically clogging it, shutting it down, um, you know, getting into the system, and and the desalination plant. I mean, this was. This is the biggest one in Israel, I, I think, um, responsible for something like 15%. I mean, I don't know. Wow. Um, of Israel's water supply. Um, and got someone's and, attention, huh? <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, then, you know, I mentioned water security before. This is like seriously threatening Israel's water security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So... That's the, okay, so now we've got an argument, which is if you don't shut, you know, if you don't build a wastewater treatment plant in Gaza, all this untreated sewage is going to threaten Israel's water security. And what do you do with that argument, right? So you sort of, and this is where the sort of the top down and the bottom up approaches come in, because the, the, the bottom up approach really is about building coalitions of, you know, of the public, of local communities mm -hmm. who are impacted by this, um, to to apply pressure on you know, on political decision makers, um, and so this is where you know, we started doing tours and community town hall events in the local community, and really you know explaining and 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 working uh, within the local community to to sort of explain the the health and you know water energy. Uh, um, you know, impacts of, uh, of not building this wastewater treatment plant. And it resulted in a letter from all the mayors um, of, you know, from this, basically what's known as the, you know, the, the Gaza envelope or, you know, the region around, the area mm -hmm. around Gaza, um, signing a letter to the prime minister uh, saying, you know, advocating for building this uh, this plant in Gaza because it, you know, not doing so, failure to do so, you know, harms their constituents, Israeli citizens. Um, and it resulted in the Prime Minister, Bibi Netanyahu, actually coming out and, um, you know, with a statement um, you know, talking about the, uh, the, the sort of Israeli security interest in allowing this... Uh, this uh, wastewater treatment plant to, to go ahead. And so the project was completed. And since then, um, you know, the, the international community has completed multiple uh, modern wastewater treatment plants in Gaza. Um, you know, what we see today is that after, um, you know, after rounds of fighting in Gaza, the, mm -hmm. the Israeli government is pretty quick trying to get electricity um, up and running again. Um, I think, you know, not out of the kindness of their hearts, but I think really out of seeing the Israeli mm -hmm. self-interest in terms of getting these things, you know, like 
Gazan wastewater treatment plants up and running um, so as to uh, as to not harm Israel's own water security. So I like this story because I think it really it sort of models how we work sort of with a science focus, right? Right, like mm -hmm. really, we are environmentalists. We bring right. science to the table. But um, as a, as humans, I I'd love to be a fly on the wall because you know the areas that you're mentioning, uh, Ashdod, Ashkelon. We're talking the you know about a mile away from Gaza, who often are getting the missiles from Gaza. And you're talking a lot about entrepreneurs working together, et cetera. And um, the new interactions, the it must be very interesting and very, I mean, do you see this development of engagement with one and with one another as the projects proceed um any interesting stories about any of that because it it seems to me that um you are like as you deal with these entrepreneurs you're right in the thick of um peace issues and the environmental issues, you know, as we've talked about, but it's, it, I would imagine it could get with, especially the different activities that go on and the different issues, like, you know, the violence and so on, extremely mm, intense at times. Yeah, I think, you know, I think things get intense at times, but we, um, yeah, you know, EcoPeace has been around for, for all that time. Um, mm -hmm. we've got people at the organization who, um, there's a guy in our Amman office who I think has been working with us 22 years, um, you know, really through the highs and lows of, of, um, regional developments, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think especially, you know, you mentioned sort of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what I work on. Um, the nice thing about working with the private sector is that there's a higher goal, which is you know, the profit margin, um, <laughs> which is not to sound really cynical, but, you know, that's an, again, I, I think sort of it exemplifies this sort of trying to find win-wins, right? So we're mm -hmm. not going to solve everything, but we're very solution oriented. Um, right. And so you don't, you know, you don't find, you're not going to find that, you know, the, the panacea, you know, the one big solution for everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, you know, it's the sort of hard slog of little wins that, you know, that, that build, you know, the moderate, communities that, that that build constituencies for for peace by getting people to trust each other more and you know and 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 to know each other more and to see that um things aren't always black and white and that you know you can vehemently disagree i mean even inside eco peace you know we, there are people from lots of different backgrounds and you know lots of different sure. groups and you know i think individually you know people one state, two state, you know, mm -hmm. vote differently, whatever, right? Um, but as an organization, we're, you know, we're 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 committed to, you know, solutions, um, you know, to to solutions that, um, you know, especially sort of in the environment and climate domain, um, and sort of sometimes you really need to cut out the noise, which isn't to say to ignore it, you know, it's. Mm -hmm. um, but you really sort of need to be very sort of focused on um, the challenge at hand and, and the solution at hand. Yeah. Um, and the part and, and, and where you yeah. do agree, a lot of peace work is, I mean, you don't take on, you know, the other person's opinion, but you look for the areas where you agree and try to yeah. work from there. 
Exactly, where you agree and where you can work together. And, um, you know, I think also in terms of, you know, like we all realize that the implications of not doing something, you know, of inaction on mm -hmm. climate and environment are really scary, you know, and so it might be, might be frustrating, might be annoying, um, you know, it might be, you might need to grit your teeth sometimes to, you know, to, to work with someone. Um, but if you don't work with, with them and you don't tackle these issues, um, you know, the, the environment, the climate crisis, the water scarcity crisis, they're not going to sit here and wait for us, you know, to, to deal with our other, get along, deal with our other shit, as they say. Um, yeah. So, um that's what we we do and i think I mean, that's what that's what works about eco pieces that we are very solution oriented it's it's really about seeing where you know where there are the win-wins um well let's let's then talk about some of these projects that uh, you're dealing with more specifically i think we've talked about how, some of it. we've talked yeah. about the water energy i mean that's the the agreement with jordan Okay. Um, and we've talked How about, about the green social entrepreneurs. Is that so? That's yeah. I mentioned that. I mean, it's the right. that's the um, it's basically a pre incubation program. It runs about five six months. Um, we take fifteen uh, Israelis, fifteen Palestinians, fifteen Jordanians around um, you know in their twenties and to mid thirties, um, mm -hmm. people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, but who are interested in gaining entrepreneurship skills and so um, and in, in sort of building a startup, uh, building a venture. Um, mm -hmm. And they get training. I mean, we, we sort of do um, uh, a whole process that really starts at looking at what are the problems, um, sort of design thinking workshop and sort of what are the problems, ideating um, sort of initial solutions to problems. Um, and then um, really sort of prototyping initial solutions, testing those, you know, sort of um, uh, looking at business development models. So, so sort of learning business development skills, you know, like pricing, operations. Um, so they really get a survey of, you know, like the, the skills you need um, to, uh, to start a business. Um, and sort of, there's a learning component to it. And there's mm -hmm. also a doing component, which is, um, you know, sort of forming these teams, learning to work together, um, getting mentoring and coaching. So we have, you know, the picture that you have there is this event that we mm -hmm. did in, um, in the Dead Sea in Jordan um, in February. And we brought, um, we brought the, all the participants um, we brought guests, so we had guest judges from uh, three different countries, from um, you know, from the Swedish embassy in mm -hmm. uh, Amman. Um, two of our directors were there. Um, you know, I brought uh, sort of a serial entrepreneur, a young serial entrepreneur, and someone from um, from uh, you know a high tech company who works on corporate social responsibility. Um, so they were they were our sort of special guests. Um, and they came to, um, to judge, you know, we had sort of a pitch night event and they, uh, they pitched their, uh, their ventures, their projects mm. to this jury, um, and, you know, and awards were handed out and they got feedback and we sort of, um, Do you remember them. what the, the top winner, what, what their, uh, what they were proposing, what they were trying to do? There are a few different groups. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the groups, for example, was looking at um, sort of uh, solutions for, they wanted to take, um, you know, an existing solution from um, an Israeli company, um, you know, plastics company, and um, sort of create this, um, this box for, you know, for urban farming um, that could also be adapted to like a refugee camp context. Um, so basically sort of promoting, um, promoting farming in, you know, for like in refugee camps and then it could be scaled, um, you know, across the, the region, um, you know, in, in Palestine, um, with Palestinian communities, 
elsewhere. Um, so that was a, you know, that was one of the, the winning groups. We had a few groups that looked at, uh, at fertilizers, you know, so taking like bio waste um, for fertilizers. Um, we had a group that was looking at turning sort of slurry waste, which is waste from, um, from the stone quarries. Oh, sorry, that's my, my dog. Um, in Palestine, it's a huge issue we have with, um, with sort of the waste from, it's called slurry. It's basically the, the sort of the um, you know, particulates from, from the, the stone quarries um, that gets into the, the water ecosystems. Um, so taking that sludge and, and turning it also into fertilizer, mm -hmm. um, a lot of work on fertilizers, actually. Um, I don't know why that's so popular. Um, but, um, but it, I mean, it was amazing, right? Like these groups, they, um, we had seven, we had seven projects, you know, at the end, um, they were constantly, I mean, this is the nature, right, of, of startups, right? Especially at the early stage, they constantly sort of pivot, um, mm -hmm. and reinvent themselves. And, um, you know, what's really cool is that being groups of Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, they, they sort of trying to trying to tackle regional environmental issues um you know they learned a lot from each other just in sort of um you know okay let's try to pilot this in palestine okay so then you know the israelis are asking the the, the palestinian um you know what he thinks about the you know, the sort of feasibility of, you know, this, uh, the rollout in, you know, specific market in, you know, in Palestine and or, you know, they want to do the pilot in Israel. So then, you know, the, the Palestinians are learning from, you know, or asking the Israel mm -hmm. sorts of questions about, you know, the, the sort of the Israeli consumer and the Israeli market. And, mm -hmm. um, and you sort of, as they're you know, forming, thinking about like piloting a product or where they might pilot something, um, mm -hmm. they're learning a lot about their lives and their context and you know the environmental concerns and um you know sort of weird conversations you know that you overhear about you know they're like teaching each other and researching like waste disposal practices you know in palestinian municipalities and like these are people right. also who, like really like to nerd out about this stuff right so they're <laughs> so excited to learn from one another about uh -huh. um, about these issues and uh and that's and that's and that's really cool so um you know it was, it was it was you know brilliant to to really see the the process also of them learning from each other um as they're trying to create and think about sort of next steps and and um you know iterating these ideas um and it was very challenging also because they're you know we had covid uh little thing you might have heard of it over in california just a um, bit so how did that impact your projects um well they did most of the you know the the program uh on zoom or hybrids mm -hmm. they got together you know, the, the israelis got together um you know the palestinians got together the jordanians got together and they sat in you know in a in a group and, and sort of communicated via um via zoom um and then or you know they sat at home on their individual monitors and communicated via zoom mm -hmm. um and only for the last event were we able to actually hold it in person physically mm -hmm. um which was a real which was a real blessing when was um, that that was in february february yeah um but uh, but yeah, I mean, we've obviously had to to adapt. I think there's no replacement for for you know in person Physical. physically oh, yeah. being together. I mean, we're um, there's just no replacement to it. As obviously, you know, I think as an organization, we were pretty prepared. You know, we we were because we're used to working across three offices. The whole sort of Zoom uh remote work thing mm -hmm. was less of a shock um but in terms of programming um there's really no replacement to to the sort of physical dimension um has it provided any um the one 
one good thing about all the Zoom, Zooming <laughs> and, and, and online interaction is that usually there's an opportunity to expand your folks who get involved. Have you seen that at all as far as international participation in your projects at all? So the last, I mean, you, um, the, the last slide I think you have. Um, okay. Well, talks well we're going to, um, okay. One of the, if you want to share your screen again, um, but basically, you know, at, um, this, at, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so one of the sort of the physical in-person things that, uh, we do a lot of is taking people on tours, you know, whether it's school groups or teachers, um, you know, or delegations of business people or diplomats, and, you know, all these things that, um, you know, when people are cooped up at home over, you know, during, during the COVID lockdowns, we weren't able to do. Um, and so that got us thinking, um, you know, how could we replicate that virtually? Um, and, and one of our, our colleagues, um, sort of very, very entrepreneurial and, uh, um, uh, and techie personality, um, really spearheaded this, this project to, um, to create a virtual experience, um, of, um, and we have two sites, um, but both in the sort of the Jordan River Valley where we work, um, and it's sort of a, you can think of it as a, um sort of a virtual tour you can think of it as a sort of video game um you know basically it's a, a metaverse experience you 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 enter this um i mean it looks like this sort of like a video game you create an avatar sort of an online uh virtual version of yourself um and you can experience in one experience which is um we really is about sort of the demise of the jordan river so about certain environmental degradation and the effects of climate change on the ecosystem um, and is really a sort of interactive way to to learn about and to experience um, you know those issues and then we created another experience that's for really geared for I think slightly more mature audiences so you know the first experience is something we can really bring to school groups um, you know, really scale up our activities, um, especially now that everyone is so much more technologically literate, you know, and digitally mm -hmm. native and schools have, you know, really gotten a lot more comfortable with, with working with tools like this. Um, and the sort of the other experiences, we call it the three borders site. So it's three farming, three agricultural communities, um, you know, one in, uh, an Israeli kibbutz, uh, a Palestinian village um, and a Jordanian community um, and there we talk about the sort of the also political um, political dimensions of our water realities, uh, the sort of trade-offs on water use, um, you know, issues around um, sort of wastewater treatment, and um, is really basically a, a way to take. You know, so we do programs, we do like tours for. Um, for university students who are studying mediation or environmental environmental issues, um, you know we've done uh, we've done sessions with folks from Switzerland, from the U.S. Um, to um, as part of you know classroom activities to um, basically experience firsthand um, you know these issues and. Um, there's sort of games within the, the site uh, where they have to uh, they have to tackle and sort of reckon with some of these complexities. Um, and the idea is really not to sort of you know preach um, preach at anyone, but to let folks experience you know the, the sort of the issues we work with on a daily basis um, and to try to think about solutions. So again, to sort of promote that solution oriented thinking um so it's a very cool i mean it's sort of an adaptive thing you know it came out of covid and needing to to take things online um but you know now we're rolling it out and there's a lot of interest from you know both 
sort of schools and teachers here in the region, but also universities and, and partners all over the world to take this and um, and use it in, in different contexts. It's exciting. Your investment program, what have we here? Um, so, you know, with the investments, basically, you know, we, we believe that, you know, getting the private sector on board is critical. Um, you know, there's a lot more interest, first of all, from the private sector in working on, you know, in, in sort of tackling um, the same issues, right? You know, corporate social responsibility, you know, ESG standards. There's a lot more awareness in the private sector today about, um, you know, the need to step up um, and, and sort of cut its carbon emissions to be socially and environmentally responsible. Um, and there's a lot of really exciting technologies around sort of the water, water issues, water use, um, water reuse, um, food technologies, energy technologies, things that we can really, um, you know, promote and pilot in the region to, um, to create jobs, to create, um, you know, sort of joint ventures and, and cooperation between business communities of Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians to promote uh, skills transfer and tech transfer, um, you know, across the region. Um, so there's, you know, and there's a lot of excitement and a lot of desire, um, from the private sector. So I think really, you know, what we're doing is, is harnessing, harnessing that, you know, first and foremost, this isn't something that we came and said, oh, it would be a great idea to, you know, to get the private, to get the private sector on board, the private sector, I think has a lot of desire and, and really just needs often, um, an organization like EcoPeace to facilitate because, we still have a lot of, um, you know, there's there's not a lot of information often, not a lot of, um, of, there's a lot of sort of hesitation, a lot of barriers, you know, trade barriers um, to to doing business, and and so an organization like EcoPeace that has a presence in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan can often really be critical in, in sort of opening doors and facilitating contacts, um, and uh, and helping sort of reduce barriers and, and risks. Um, so what we're doing is working with entrepreneurs from you know from all three countries and um, with investors both locally and internationally, um, and you know international financial and development organizations to promote um, to promote pilots um, of all sorts of exciting projects. Um, you know both in um, in Jordan and Palestine. So things like, you know, solar farms and- um, um, Yeah, I have to uh, ask, what's the thing with the grasshoppers? It's giving me the creeps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a slightly, <laughs> so this is something that I'm working on. Um, yeah? That's a regional project, right? So we have these sort of local pilot projects and then we also have a regional, regional projects. Um, and the, you know, there's an Israeli startup, a very, very, very cool Israeli startup. Um, called Chagol, which means grasshopper in, in Hebrew. Um, and Chagol um, basically takes grasshoppers, which are one of nature's, um, if not nature's most efficient source of protein, um, and turn it into um, basically a, a powder for, um, you know, for use in all sorts of other food products. So it's what's known as a, as a B2B company, um, right, for you know, four other companies. So, um, you know, I won't get into the specifics of why it's so great, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, I will mention uh, that it's kosher and halal. So actually grasshoppers are, you know, are, are okay um, to eat in, you know, both Islam and Judaism. Um, they are a real, I mean, they're really, really healthy, it turns out. Um, and it turns out they also don't have, this isn't a, like a taste like chicken situation. They, they're actually pretty <laughs> neutral in flavor, um, and, you know, and have all sorts of properties that make them a great addition to all sorts of other food products. Um, you know, have a really I mean, long are they, flow. are they 
it, it's uh, they're added for nutrition on for nutrition. Yeah, for or... nutritional value for protein, um, for you know, and also for you know, food companies add you know all sorts of things to you know to color and to you know for texture um, and to bind things and you know and there's all sorts of different uses for you know for this this product. Um, you know, I'll let the company speak for itself, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so anyone who's interested should, should, you know, should look them up. Um, but it is, as I said, I'm very, very convinced um, by what I know about it. And this they, other, uh, this other. Um, so I'll just mention, you know, what we're doing with, uh, you know, with Hargol is uh, uh, that we, um, you know, they basically have you know, a few different steps of, you know, of farming. Um, you know, they, they, they have this sort of original breeding, initial breeding, and then the sort of fattening process. Um, you know, and they also grow feed for the grasshoppers. Um, and basically the idea is as part of the scale up, you know, as part of their growth and, and, and scaling up their production capacity um, to, build, to build farms in Jordan. You know, so what we're trying mm -hmm. to do is, um, you know, help them write a business case and, you know, for uh, building these operations in, in Jordan, identified a Jordanian partner and, um, and taking this to investors um, who, um, who are, you know, very interested. We've, we've, we've really had a lot of interest in this because, um, you know, it's not just a sort of nice regional cooperation uh, story. Uh, it really makes a lot of business sense. And I think that's the, that's the thing here is to, you know, to really identify also ideas that, you know, that have a business case um, as well as, you know, to, to really find the sort of the business case in regional cooperation. Um, so, awesome. yeah, so that's, you know, that's Hagol. Um, that's a chickpea plant. Um, ah. I, I, I hope it is. Um, and, uh, you know, this is another company that we've been working with, um, that, uh, that basically similar also in the sort of the, the food tech space, alternative proteins, um, they extract, uh, protein, um, and some other, you know, starches and oils from chickpeas. Um, and they're looking to, um, you know, to also, uh, I won't elaborate too much on, on this one, um, but, um, you know, also looking to bring a presence locally um, and, you know, helping them, helping them do that, identify a Palestinian partner, um, you know, and in the process, the idea would be to, to also promote livelihoods in Palestine, right? So instead of uh farmers elsewhere growing these chickpeas right to, to have palestinian farmers grow the chickpeas and you know before they grow the chickpeas uh they'd be they'd be getting you know the the skills um and the the sort of technologies to do it in you know the way the company wants right so sort of knitting this you know this public private um investment that would be they would both promote skills transfer and, and tech transfer um, and create sustainable jobs in the Palestinian agricultural sector. Um, and it's an Israeli company. So, you know, there's a, there's a dimension here of, of cooperation, uh, just in that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I should mention obvious chickpeas is used for hummus. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so, um, so great uh, healthy snack that everybody enjoys um make, make hummus not war all right um so i have to ask uh, mm -hmm. uh i always like to ask a couple personal questions how, how did you get interested in uh the environment and in peace uh so i got interested in peace um, yeah, I've always, I think I've always been, I've always been very peaceful. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, I, I think it was mostly, so when I was in college at Yale, um, 
I took part in a dialogue group that was formed there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't just Israelis and Palestinians. It was, there were also um, a lot of American Jews and a lot of um, you know, Arabs from the wider region. Mm-hmm. So Egyptians, Jordanians, um, you know, Emiratis. This was before the Abraham Accords. Um, folks from you know, Lebanese. Um, and we'd get together once a week and mm. sort of pick a, usually pick a sort of a topic or mm-hmm. um, someone would share and, you know, people would react and sometimes it would get very heated and, um, mm-hmm. you know, we had, we had sort of a, a few tense moments, um, but for the most part, it was, you know, that was one of my, my, my communities, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, created a lot of, you know, beautiful friendships, lasting friendships there. Um, and it really got me, that really got me curious about the sort of, this space. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what sort of sent me to do a master's in Middle Eastern studies. Um, and I sort of, I, I, when I, when I did my, when I signed up for my master's, I thought I wanted to study the, Israeli Palestinian conflict. Mm-hmm. When I got there, I realized that um, you know that I actually there was so much more to the Middle East than than the conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did coursework in lots of other things mm-hmm. that have nothing to do with uh, with our little plot of of land. Um, <laughs> and um, but I you know when I came back here. Um, you know, I'd also been doing some work with um, with the the World Bank and, and on sort of on non climate things like political analysis of you know various places in the Middle East and in Africa, um, and sort of there somehow got into this sort of climate security space, and then you know, started doing some stuff for the UN around climate security and. Um, and that's sort of how I came into this this climate environment thing. Um, and sort of learned learned the lingo around that, um, and really came to see. I mean, I think what what sort of brought me to the intersection of the two and, and to eco peace was was really the desire to to do to work in a space where there's still momentum, where I can you know, really feel like I can make a difference and um, sort of not just rehearse the sort of the the tired platitudes. Um, you know, I think there's there's really a lot of potential through you know the 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 acute sort of crisis of climate change um, and of water scarcity to to build coalitions and to build bridges. Um, that um, yeah, then you know things that have that have just really been stalled for for a long time. Yeah. Um, so you know, so <clears throat> so yeah, so that I mean that's what brought me here, and I um... okay. Um, for your last question, I wanted to ask, what's the next area of the environment where you and your, all your colleagues uh, will focus to improve? What's, what's the hot environmental area that you can cooperate with, with, with each other? I mean, so there's, you know, wa- water, the water issue is not going away. Um, yeah, it's worth for sure. We're thinking a lot about it's a hot um, topic in a desert, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of sort of cooperation around uh, cross-boundary streams and um, um, sort of specific challenges around um, specific sorts of, of pollution. You know, I mentioned the slurry mm-hmm. before the, the, from the stone quarries, mm-hmm. um, you know, from things like slaughterhouses and. Um, you know, and organic waste, and you know, and then it gets into wastewater treatment plants and creates, you know, a whole mess. And um, so, really identifying um, identifying solutions from the private sector, maybe you know, around around some of those challenges. 
Um, so that's a big one. Um, you know, getting you know the the sort of the the energy, the alternative, or the the sort of renewable energy space. Um, you know, is is really exciting, and you know, and, and the needs there are just growing. Um, and you know, especially now that we've got this this Israel Jordan water for energy deal. There's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of credibility for EcoPeace as an organization to to work and and you know to bring more regional players um, you know into this into this um, you know cooperation on on energy um, you know, and so really looking at um, the wider region and you know and and, and how we can harness the you know, the natural resources, especially the sun, you know, and, and, and the sort of large plots of unused desert land in, in the region to to create a lot of uh, renewable energy for for Europe, um, you know, especially now with Ukraine, for example, you know, see that Europe needs an alternative source of energy. Um, you know, a lot of that can come from the Middle East, where there's a lot of Work now being done to connect electricity grids, uh, you know, across the the world. So to to connect Europe and and the Middle East, Europe and Africa, and you know, how can we harness that and um, to um, you know to 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 also build bridges um, around the energy space. So that's you know that's another big sort of big initiative thing that we're starting to think about. Fabulous. So thanks so much for your time today, Yuval. It's great to hear about an organization that brings together these parties normally thought of as having strained relationships and because of their mutual need to use the limited environment responsibly, they put aside differences and work together in a more peace-filled atmosphere. Next week, we'll have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Norbert Goldfield, founder and executive director of Healing Across the Divides. Healing Across the Divides is an organization comprised of American medical professionals who bring together and assist their Israeli and Palestinian counterparts in creating bridge building programs that improve the health of both Israelis and Palestinians. As you can see, many people are working very hard to improve the lives of Jewish, Arab, and Palestinian people in the Middle East, promoting cooperation. And Peace with Penny strives to get the word out that there is hope for peace in the region. Next week, we'd love for you to join us again. We hope that the situation will calm down in Israel and that there'll be better news for the people of Ukraine and Russia. For now, We'll leave you as we pray that everyone will someday live in peace, shalom, and salam. <laughs>